So, but before we get started with uh, Catherine's herbs class, I just wanted to make a quick announcement and I assume you all saw my emails this, uh, earlier today, but uh, I'll be happy to answer any questions if there are any also about the final exam. Uh, one, I'll just ask again, um, the, the, my, my one request of everyone uh, in the class is to take the five to 10 minutes to complete the course survey. I really appreciate your feedback. Um, we do use that information to help us improve our programs and that's why we do it. Uh, so if you can give us your honest constructive feedback, we appreciate it. We love, we of course love to know what we do well, but uh, we wanna know what could we could improve uh, on as well so that our programs continue to grow and continue to get better. Um, the, uh, the final exam was also posted in the course module uh, and hope uh, for those of you who are planning to become Master Gardener volunteers, uh, the, the final exam is How do required I know that? to become a I just went into Master Zoom. Gardener. You need to pass the exam with a 80% passing score or better. Uh, the exam itself, let me share my screen here. The exam itself, you can find in the final exam module. And you can see I broke it up into sections. So the total exam is 80 questions, but I broke it up into 12 sections and uh, there's somewhere between three and nine questions in each of the sections. So you don't have to worry about doing all 80 at the same time. And you can, so the order these are in follows the class schedule, uh, but you can take, you can take the exams in, in any order. Uh, but I broke it up that way. So you, I didn't, I didn't have to worry about it and you didn't have to worry about trying to do it all, sit down and do it all at once. Uh, so you can break it up and um, the other thing is you've got two opportunities or two attempts to answer the questions. So you can go in here and answer the questions and might give away the first question. Oh, I'll tell you if it says choose the best answer or uh, if there's only one option. If it's choose all that apply, it, uh, you can select as many or as few of the options uh, as you wish. Choose the right answer and submit your answers. I'm just clicking, I'm not actually trying to answer these. It's going to tell you that your grade after you hit submit. So I got three out of six, right? Okay, it shows you what questions you got wrong. It shows you what answers you chose. So I missed the first question, the fifth and the sixth question. Okay, so then I can go in and take the test again and it will record my highest score of the two attempts. Okay, um, so you've got two attempts to take it and after your second attempt it will show you the correct answers along with the answers that you chose. Okay, if you need further clarification or have, you know, additional questions uh, disagree with the answers, <laughs> uh, that's fine. Uh, feel free to reach out uh, to me and hopefully I can help clarify if there are any, anything, if there's any confusion. Okay. Um, you have until January 31st to complete the exam. Uh, it's open book, open notes, use the internet, call your friends open your book, 
Um, use that, that's a nice tools. way, Chris, of saying go ahead and cheat. Use whatever tools you want to <laughs> uh, to uh, help you answer the questions and find the answers. Yep. So, any questions? Don't stress about it. Um, hopefully, it's not uh, a point of stress. Uh, the point of the test is not to uh, stress you out and it's really not to force you to memorize all of this information. It's to reinforce the knowledge that you gained, what you, you know, what you learned in the class, but also if you don't know the answer, where to find those answers. So finding a good, having a good resource library, your Master Gardener book is full of great information. Um, you know, so it's not about memorizing all this information and knowing it all off the top of your head, but knowing where to find the information and where to go to find that information um, is also important. So uh, hopefully that um, helps with any questions or stress that you might have had about the final exam. Again, and again, it's optional for um, the people in the class who aren't planning on volunteering, becoming a, an active master gardener. But if you wanna take the exam, um, I'd encourage you to. Uh, and please also take, again, take the uh, five or 10 minutes to complete the course evaluation and tell us what you think about the, the master gardener class. I'd really appreciate all of your input. So um, with that, I don't see any questions coming up in the chat box. So um, with that, I'll hand things over to Catherine Wisner, our speaker tonight. Uh, thank you, Catherine, for adding this class on to the end of the schedule. And thanks for inviting the Laramie County Master Gardeners uh, to join us uh, for tonight's class. Uh, Catherine, you'll remember Catherine, uh, she taught the landscape design and site analysis class and she taught the season extension class earlier in the schedule as well. And um, just a reminder, Catherine is the Laramie County Master Gardener Coordinator. And for those of you in Cheyenne, uh, make sure that you reach out and connect with Catherine to get connected uh, with her and the group there in Cheyenne. So Catherine, thanks again for being here. Really appreciate you taking the time. And it's good to see so many of you uh, tonight. We'll have kind of a similar format to our previous classes. Um, Catherine's going to talk to us tonight about growing herbs and try to answer all of our questions. So Catherine, thanks a lot for being here. All right. Yeah, you're welcome, Chris. Thanks. So I'm going to kind of do this both, um, you know, we'll jump to PowerPoint, then I'll jump off PowerPoint. So kind of go back and forth a little bit so that I kind of break up some of the monotony of a PowerPoint program. And you know, just a little bit about, I've been growing herbs since I was about 12. I dug up part of my dad's backyard and I had a high tunnel for a long time and grew a massive amount of herbs in the high tunnel. And I've grown them out outside of the high tunnel too. I've, I've got a tarragon plant that's probably 15 years old now and it's it gets two feet tall and it's about three feet wide so it's tough as tough as nails it's got to be <laughs> live in Wyoming and um, deal with the wind and the drought so I'm going to share my screen here so Chris if you could make me co-host so I can do that So, yeah, sorry, Catherine, just one second. I'm, I have to, uh, sorry, when I spotlight the video on you, then it doesn't let me, I don't see the little tool bar that allows me to make you co-host. There you go. And then I will, there you go. Sorry about that. Now you should be able to share. Sorry about that. All right. OK. 
Okay, can everybody see this PowerPoint program? Oh. So I'm gonna kind of jump back and forth between doing the PowerPoint and, and some of the little props I've got, because again, like so, I wanna to try to break this up a little bit. This program isn't real long, so it's it's not going to go until nine o'clock by any stretch. So you guys will have kind of a an easy evening off here. So there is, in case you didn't know, there is the International Herb Association, and every year they pick a herb of the year, and this year it was in the genus Rubus. So that means your raspberries and blackberries and all those all those guys. Those guys are herbs. And even the leaves are usable as far as making teas out of. So herb, the herb family is huge. And there's a lot of herbs in there that you would just never guess were actually herbs. But they've also picked, the International Herb Association has picked for 2021, parsley is the herb of the year. So a lot of different varieties of parsley. Doesn't have to be that boring decoration on your plate, but um, it, it can be kind of a fun one to grow. But the International Herb Association is just an absolute wealth of information. So if you, you get stumped on an herb or you're curious about an herb, this is really a good place to go to get that information if, if your extension person can't help you out on it. But this is, this is another great resource. So from a botanical viewpoint, an herb is a seed plant that does not produce a woody stem like a tree, but an herb will live long enough to develop with flowers and seeds. And I put maybe back there because this rule is kind of violated with bay laurel and bay laurel is a tree and you can grow that tree like a house plant, like you would a ficus. And it's a pretty tough, durable tree. It's used in the landscapes a lot in, in a more temperate climate. Uh, it would be something I would expect to see down in like the Carolinas or um, even down in Arizona. Steve, that's kind of a, grow it outside. And I saw a lot of this just as an ornamental tree uh, in England. So it it's, does tolerate cool weather quite a bit. There are several herb catalogs out there that, that are, are just worth their weight in gold. One of them is Richter's out of Canada, and I have ordered quite a bit of, of live plants from them and seeds. And so it does, you can cross that Canadian US border with plants. Seed Savers Exchange, uh, you guys sh should be familiar with them. That's a, a pretty well known seed. <laughs> catalog company, kind of using that term loosely, but they do specialize in heirloom seeds specifically. And so I'm going to stop sharing here. Okay. So normally when I teach this in person, I have this catalog. I have, I'm going to get rid of my background because it's making me crazy. Um, so if I don't have a background, you guys got to put up with the mess behind me. So this is my, my cabin, my workshop cabin. But um, this, this is an amazing catalog. And normally when I do this class in person, everyone gets a Richter's catalog. And, and the, the information in here is, is phenomenal. If you were to try to buy a, a book that had the information in here that this catalog does, it would cost you an arm and a leg. And they usually have a picture of the herb and then it goes on and talks about how to grow the herb and what it's used for medicinally and culinarily. And it also lets you know that if it's not used for either one of those, but it's an ornamental. So I, I know you can read this. I know you can see it, right? Yeah. <laughs> but this is an amazing, an amazing resource. And they would, they're more than happy to send you a catalog. The website's pretty phenomenal too. The people there are great. I've talked with them at length and, and it's just, it's a fun, okay. I'm a geeky horticulturist and I think this is fun to read at bedtime. 
Okay. But it does, again, it does talk about what, um, it talks at length about the plants and gives you information. Um, like here's one on Blue Boy Rosemary. Diminutive, compact size and free flowering habit makes it ideal for indoor pot culture. Excellent flavor. And then it also gives you all the little symbols um, for culinary use for, it's, uh, you can use rosemary as a tea. And so it's, um, you, you can't buy this information in a book, but they'll send this to you free. Can't beat that. Free, you can't beat free. Okay. Oh. This is my other favorite seed catalog, is Johnny's. They don't have as many varieties of herbs in it. In fact, I think they only list like 36. But again, Johnny's goes to, goes to great length to talk about how to grow these herbs their cultural requirements for them. Talks about, I have no idea if you guys can even see these pictures, but it does talk about how to grow them, what they look like. You know, dill, it's called dill weed for a reason. You drop a seed on the ground. Dill actually likes um, sunlight, needs sunlight to germinate, so it's kind of an oddball. So a couple of fun catalogs. Like I said, I, I'm, I'm a geeky horticulturist, and I think reading that stuff at night is, how I fall asleep. So, so you don't have to look at the clutter behind me. There. Right. I have to look at all that stuff there. Um, yeah, it, it is an awesome catalog. <laughs> who, who would guess? You know, a catalog, really? Okay, I'm going to share the screen again. And, okay. Yeah, Seed Savers Exchange, 350 different types of herbs to grow. You know, just even in the Richter's catalog, there's, um, there's like 50 different types of basil, 40 different types of mint you know, sage and, and 10 choices on bee balms. It's, it, you know, you can't dig up enough. You should be digging your lawn up and planting herbs and, and perennials instead. So almost all your herbs are almost all, but not all of them, good majority of them, are gonna fall into the Laminacea family. And this is, this is kind of loosely known as the mint family. And the way you tell is <coughs> you look at the stem and you're gonna rub your fingers down the stem and the stem is usually kind of fuzzy, but it's square. And so you can, you can feel that, that, those edges and you can feel that it's square and not round. And that's, that's usually a really good indication that this is in the Laminacea family. It's a mint, something in the mint family. Usually when the foliage is crushed, if you take the foliage and you rub it in your hands like this, it's going to, um, one, your hands will warm it up. And so those volatile oils will really be accentuated. And so it's going to have a very, typically a very pleasant fragrance to it. Um, culinary uses predominantly, exceptions to all these rules here. But it's a big family. It is about 210 genera and 3,500 different species. So it, it's there's a lot of there's a lot of choices. Most of them make um, miserable house plants. There are some exceptions, but they usually want to be outside. And then what do you do with them? And and I, I run into this problem. This is why I started to teach herbs because I kept running into people going, well, I don't know what to do with them. And, and it's like, oh, really? <laughs> so many choices, so many, you know, culinary uses for them. But there's, there's herbs that are really strong that have a good, a good punch of flavor to them. Those are like winter savory and rosemary and sage. Those are really strong, strong herbs. And there's your, your herbs that are a little bit more background. And your basils, your mints, dills, marijum. I think marijum is a pretty mild herb. And, and then you can use you can use them both in, in cooking and in baking. And some of these cross over into that, that realm. 
and I mean, even right down to the flowers, a lot of times the flowers are edible and they're actually really quite tasty. If you've ever chewed on a nasturtium flower, they're peppery flavored and they're just, they're just a wonderful addition to a salad. Um, herbs for blending, you know, um, herbs to Provence. That's, that's an amazing blend. That's a wonderful blend of herbs. And there's, there's two different variations of herbs to Provence. And the, the true French does not have any lavender in it. So if you're reading the, the ingredient list on herbs to Provence, and it says it has lavender in it, then it's more of a North American blend. Because for whatever reason, I guess we think we need to have lavender in our herbs to Provence but it's actually not, doesn't belong there in, in true, in the true form of it. And I'm gonna check the chat here. Basil can get woody too, but many different cell structures. I've, I've actually never had basil really get woody on me just because I keep, I prune it, I trim it back ruthlessly. I mean, just ruthlessly. I mean, you can take a lawnmower to it and prune it back. You can be that brutal on it. And um, lemon balm. Lemon balm is a really nice one to add to just plain white vinegar and let it seep for a while. And it makes an awesome salad dressing. So almost all of these, you can put in vinegar and do a, a vinegar infusion and you know, even blends of, of herbs for vinegar infusion and then use it as a salad dressing. And Real nice punch of flavor. I think it's better than what you buy in the store. A lot of these herbs are what makes perfumes. And again, what we know of herbs and what we think of herbs is just a very tiny bit of what is actually used out there. And again, if you go through the Richter's catalog and it's, this is actually pretty thick about a fourth of an inch thick. And so there's a lot of a lot of stuff in there and they'll talk about things, herbs in there that could be used for making your own perfumes or your own potpourri. So lots of things you can do with this. Make your own herb blend, make your own herbs to Provence, you yeah. <coughs> know. Make a make a special blend and call it herbs do Chris or herbs do barb. <laughs> And it's, it's your own personal blend. Um, a lot of them have bright colored foliage and flowers. Um, most of your herbs are going to have just white flowers, light colored flowers. Valerian, which is the herb that um, um, eventually got synthesized into Valium. So it's, a, it's kind of a comative. Crimson blooms at Borge. Um, Borers has got sky blue flowers. I've got a picture of it in here and beautiful sky blue flowers. And the flowers are edible, very much edible. And they're very, very tasty. Um, um, there's some of them that are, the leaves are variegated. There's a lot of mints that are variegated. There's some thyme that's variegated. So you can have a lot of, use these in a lot of um, landscape interest. I've got mint growing in the front of my cabin. And I've got it growing there so I can keep it in, in check. Otherwise, it will take, try to take over. There's some that um, St. John's wort is an herb. And that's one that is, they watch that one really closely because that can jump into um, the landscape, into pastures and, and get away. So that's, that's one. Some places you actually can't grow that. Um, hyssop or hyssop, sweet sicily, echinacea. Uh, I have a hard time growing echinacea in my soils here, and I go back east to Missouri and it's growing in the ditch. And it's like, it just doesn't seem fair. And then chives, of course, I have a lot of different types of chives. They're easy to grow. The flowers on chives are really tasty. Um, when they start to go to bloom, I cut, the, I cut the flower heads off and I'll chop them up and I'll throw them in a salad because they're also really good. Um, let's see, a question. My neighbor tried to plant mint on a slope in her backyard, but they didn't do well. The mint, so mint wants cool, moist, part shade. 
So that's why that didn't do well. Southwest facing, it just got baked. It hated it there. It, it most likely just died. If she had had it on a northeast facing slope and had irrigation to it, it would have done okay. But mint is not a hot, dry, doesn't tolerate it at all. And that's, that's kind of a hallmark with herbs is that they're not really drought tolerant. Some of them are. Chives can be very drought tolerant. Lavender, lavender prefers to have its roots dry. So there's some exceptions to this. But for the most part, herbs want a really moist soil. And, and they'll almost all do well in part shade. So that's, that's why your neighbor's mint didn't do well. It, was, it just was in the totally wrong environment for it. So now as you as a master gardener get to tell her that. <clears throat> Medicinal herbs. I, I find this just absolutely fascinating. 2,500 plants have historically been used for medicines. Only 250 of those have been investigated. However, less than 10% of new drugs coming onto the market are entirely man-made and nearly 80% are derived from plant material. So, so we're still relying a lot on, on herbs and, and plants as our, as our medicine. And there's a lot out there that we just don't know. Herb gardens, you know, one has, you know, way back, way back in the day, they were very fancy, very fussy, very formal, clipped, pruned. People had more time. <laughs> they were very precise. And in, in, to, in our world today, we, very few people have that kind of time. And so this is normally what they look like. And this is just a really fun little herb garden, very informal in a backyard in, in Cheyenne. And it's, it kind of takes care of itself. And that's kind of what it should be. It just should kind of take care of itself and bring the bees in and you walk in there and clip what you need for a salad. And, and then uh, just let it go. But there's um, there's sage in there. There's hyssops. There's um, oh, it looks like there's some dill in there and tarragon. You know, a whole bunch of stuff growing in there. So it's just kind of fun. So you don't have to have it neat and tidy. It doesn't have to be in a row. It can it could be part of the landscape like this one here. So perennial herbs. Artemisias, um, I, I don't really know culinarily what they're good for. Maybe teas, maybe tinctures. Bay laurel, I, I can hardly cook a super stew without my bay laurel. And again, that you can grow that as a tree in the house and it'll grow just like a ficus. And so that it's actually carefree, easy to do. Just go pick the, pick a few leaves, let them dry out, and use them that evening. Uh, bee balm, burnet, catnip. I've got catnip growing at my place, and it is it's tough and hardy. And so my my hardy um, test for a lot of this stuff is if my sheep get loose and they graze it down and it comes back, then it's a it's pretty tough Wyoming plant. And so the catnip's been grazed down a couple times and it keeps coming back. So it's a, it's a winter, <laughs> a Wyoming winter. Roses, garlic, feverfew, germander, lavender. Again, lavender is one that likes it. It doesn't want its feet wet. When you think of where it's grown for production, um, parts of the state of Washington on the drier parts of Washington and in Provence, France, very dry climate, very less than you know, 15 inches of moisture a year. And it does not like to have its feet wet. It just doesn't tolerate overwatering. It's not real happy about our wind, but it's it is a very durable plant. It actually likes the soil a little bit more alkaline too. Um, mint, oregano. We will talk about oregano because there's a couple of different types out there. Sage, salvary, salvia, winter savory. Um, I've had winter savory go for about three seasons, three winters before it just kind of gives it up. Sorrel, tarragon, thyme. My thyme is doing awesome. It just, it just keeps on growing. Benign neglect, totally benign neglect, growing in the shade and it's just 
just happy as all can be. Um, ornamental, typically not edible. And so with the herbs, you've got to be real careful with, um, with some of these guys. So, can, so I'm looking at the questions here again. Um, can you tell which direction this garden faces? So back to that other, yeah, that the brick wall was facing south. So that was whole south exposure, which, which really kind of surprised me because it was a, it was a hot location. And I've got another master gardener with a similar situation and grows amazing tomatoes in that. Um, but she keeps it moist enough that it doesn't, it doesn't get, it doesn't dry out. Do all laminaceae want to be pruned? Um, they're all prunable and they all should be kept down, especially the ones that are annuals. Yep. Um, Artemisia, yarrow, you can actually make a tea out of yarrow. Um, if, you, if you're looking at the medicinal area, which I really don't, I don't touch on in this class, um, there is some information on, on using yarrow as a tea. I can't imagine it tasting very good because the plant doesn't smell very good. Monk's hood, belladonna, um, chaparral, crown vetch, foxglove, geranium, periwinkle. Now with the ger geranium, you can make a, you can distill it for an oil and, and use it just um, like aromatherapy type thing. But these are ones that you really have to be very careful with in the landscape. As much as I, I've grown monk's hood in the past, it was before sheep, and so I, so I don't grow some of these guys. Um, my sheep have grazed the yarrow down without any problems, and the yarrow has come back. But um, as much as I like those other ones, um, I just uh, I don't want to take a risk with it. And so, some general rules for growing herbs, and in a in a perfect or in a perfect gardening world, right? Um, your soil would be fairly neutral. And again, herbs seem to tolerate an alkaline soil a little bit more than they do an acidic soil. And they don't want their soil really fertile. So don't go crazy trying to make it this wonderful soil mixture and back alley soil. I and mean, really poor soil, they're happier in poor soil. About six hours of sunlight, more, more if you can do it. Six hours is minimal what I'd go with. And if you do have to fertilize, and again, I try not to do that with my herbs, you want to use a slow release or fertilizer like Osmocote or a, a plant-based, vegetable-based compost. When I say it's like kitchen scraps so that it, it decomposes over time and releases slowly and not a big hit all at once. So never use, uh, pick on miracle Grow again, but don't use miracle Grow with your herbs. What happens here is when the herb gets over fertilized, gets too much nitrogen, it grows so much and it loses its flavor in the process. And so what you're, and what you're growing it for is that flavor, too much nitrogen tells it to grow and it exceeds its ability to, to hang on to those volatile oils and they diminish. So you want to be really careful with how much fertilizer you do use and you want to keep that really low like 5% or less. So again look at that that bag or bottle of fertilizer and, and look at those numbers. I don't care what the advertising says it's for, even if it's house plant food you're okay. But just be real careful with, with fertilizing, no manures, don't get me, you guys don't want to get me on my manure soapbox, right? Um, water, they are not, herbs are not drought tolerant. They're right up there with vegetables. They are not drought tolerant and they're going to need at least an inch of water a week. And, and then mulching to help keep them from drying out. So I'm gonna stop sharing. And so when it comes to irrigation, so this, kind of coiled up mess I've got here. Oh, I'm also going to get rid of my backdrop. So, okay, all right. 
So this is, um, it used to be made by Netafilm and now it's John Deere Water and now it's somebody else. And of course I lost the label for it, but it's this brown, very flexible um, drip emitted watering system. And so you can kind of see the little black dot there, I hope, that's a drip emitter. And then there's another little emitter there. And, and so they're about 12 inches apart. You know, you can use your own drip tape or soap or hose, but again, you want to keep the water on the ground. You, you don't want to be throwing water around like on a, on a sprinkler oscillating system thing. You don't want that. Um, keep the water on the ground. You want to try to keep the leaves dry, right? Leaves dry. That way you're not going to have as many disease problems, bacteria, fungal. Those are not good eats. And the same thing with the, um, the fertilizer. Too much fertilizer, again, too much nitrogen makes that plant very sweet and succulent. And then that brings in aphids. And <laughs> I don't know about you, but I do not want to be eating, eating crunchy little aphids on my salad. Ew. Um, are the drip emitters one gallon an hour? No, they're about a quarter of a gallon an hour. And you always, always have to have a filter system on the front end of this. So, hang on. I have all the toys. Um, so the filter system here, and again, this just screws off. There's your little 200 mesh filter. Easy to clean, easy to use. And water from the hose comes in here, comes out here. And so you got a series of reducers, pressure regulator, pressure reducer here, because you only want about 12 PSI going into this guy, nothing more. Otherwise you'll blow it out and a very interesting water feature. <laughs> When you really did plan on one, right? So pressure reducer on there. These are easy to put together. Easy tab A into slot B, glue it all together. Easy peasy. And let's see, they're about a fourth of a gallon per hour per each emitter. Um, if you don't have a filter on there, you, you can get sand and silt in there, and that can be a problem. And then hard minerals in the water. Yeah, that's a problem. That is kind of describes all of Wyoming water. You can, you can pour a little bit of vinegar in here and flush the whole system with vinegar. That will help it out a lot. I've been using this stuff since it came out. Um, it, the original stuff was much, much larger. It was a half inch thick. This is a fourth of an inch thick. And so um, I've, I've never had my drip tape or this stuff clog because of hard water. And I'm all on a well. Um, my garden is city water. Does that still need a filter? Yes, yes, absolutely. Always put a filter on this. Even though I've got like three filters before it ever gets out to the to the garden. And I've never I've never clogged it. I I I've done other things. I run it over with a lawnmower and it's not happy with that, but I've never clogged it with minerals or silt. <laughs> so, so let's see. Yep. Okay. Filters are important. Okay. Okay. Back to the slides here. So Chris, I don't know what I'm doing wrong here that it's not jumping back to where I want it to be, but okay. Okay. Another question here. Do you recommend to bury the drip tape to the level of the roots or what are you watering? I just lay, I just lay this right, I just lay this right on the, on the soil. And right now it's really cold, so it's stiff, but once it gets in that sun and warms up, it's, it's a lot more bendy, it's a lot more easy to work. You can do circles, and Chris has used this in his, um, in his um, orchard up at UW, this Netafilm brown flexible stuff. 
Um, I think you use the big brother to this. This is just a little quarter gallon per hour. And, and so it's very flexible, very easy to work with. You can pull it apart, you can cut it and put it together. You can, I have an emitter put on here so I can put it on a, on some black plastic, black plastic tubing. And I mean, I have, I have fun, have fun with this really. Uh, once you get going with it, once you get comfortable with it, you, you'll be amazed at what, what you'll do next and, and how much line you all of a sudden have running through your garden. So it's, it's easy to work with and it's, it just gives you so much versatility and flexibility on, on garden expansion. <laughs> get rid of that turf grass, plant flowers, plant, plant herbs, yeah. Okay, some herbs that should be brought as plants. Some of these are just trying to start them from seed is either impossible or the seed doesn't exist or um, it just takes so long to germinate. So rosemary, tarragon, or oregano, lemon verbena, and lavender. You can start lavender from seed, and I've certainly got master gardeners that have done it. It takes, it can take months for it to germinate. So in the meantime, you're babysitting it, you're watering it, and you're wondering, how does it, is it still there, is it rotted? So you're babysitting it. Once it does germinate and starts to grow, it could take it another two to three years before it blooms. That's, that's a long time to, for reward. 99% of your lavender is done off of cuttings. So those cuttings are then rooted and sold and potted up and then sold as a plant. And, and so lavender is really easy to take cuttings from and root from. Um, so is rosemary, tarragon, um, oregano, lemon, those are all really easy to, to do cuttings off of and, and grow just by rooting them up. Okay, more in the chat. Um, so Barb Gorgeous, lavender works well from seed using winter sowing methods. Um, where do you buy the irrigation supplies? Uh, there's a catalog called Dripworks. There's another catalog out there. There's a couple catalogs for irrigation. We've got, um, we have Home Depot and Menards in Cheyenne, and they both carry this. In fact, that's, that's, I got this at the big box store, which really surprised me when I found it there. I didn't expect to see that. So I bought it. <laughs> I found it and I bought it. It's like, oh, there's, there's a treasure. Okay, so harvesting. This is um, this is to get the maximum flavor. So I like to pick, especially when it comes to basil. Because basil, if you don't handle basil correctly, it, the leaves bruise and it'll it'll turn black on you. So so how you harvest is really important, and it should be picked early in the morning. And then let me, let me back up. You can start harvesting leaves off of these plants as soon as the plant is big enough and has enough foliage to maintain growth. So if it's only maybe a few inches tall, five inches tall, but it's got like six or seven leaves on it, go ahead and start, start harvesting. It just don't take so much that it doesn't, um, don't want to come back. Um, yeah, drip irrigation, okay. Uh, lavender germination and growth sounds a lot like orchids. Oh, yeah, I don't. Uh, we've, there's a master gardener here in Laramie County that grows orchids, and oh, my hat's off to her. That's those are tough. Um, but again, I, you want to pick these early in the morning. You want to harvest early in the morning. You want to wash them off with cold water, then dry them. I will, if I take lavender and I, and I cut it by the stem, I'll still wash it off with cold water and then I'll put it in a little glass of water. You can put them in the refrigerator, in a warmer part of your refrigerator and, and hold them. But there's something that should be used pretty quickly. They can, you can dry these. And I've, I used to dry a lot of herbs and make my own herb blends and You'd be amazed at all the different places you can dry herbs that are they're pretty effective. I've just set them out on a on a clean screen, like a window screen, 
and dried them in a sunny window or a sunny spot in the house. Um, <laughs> one year I used my husband's Subaru as a as a dryer and I had stacked them up, stacked some bricks up and some um, window screen and I put herb, I put all my basil and a whole bunch of herbs in there. I mean, it just, it just smelled, it smelled like, it smelled incredible. <laughs> it just smelled incredible. And uh, that worked out really well. I uh, left the window open a little bit and it got really hot in there and there was enough air circulation that they just dried beautifully. Um, you have to have an understanding husband to use the car as a, as an herb dryer. So you want to harvest also before the flower buds open. And, and so when it starts to flower and those flowers open up, you start to lose the intensity of the oils in the leaves. And so they start to lose their flavor. It may not be real noticeable, but it, it will diminish the flavor, especially, you know, I mean, that's what you're going for, right, is the flavor. And so as soon as it starts to bloom, you lose that. And, and so when it's one of the few times where I'm gonna tell you to go cut the flowers off and just put them in your compost pile. So what to grow and how to grow it. Okay, there's a question in chat. Um, does Richter's catalog have recipes for herb blends? Not that I have noticed, but I, I think those herb blends are, can be kind of, you can personalize them or you can just get, um, go take a look and see what's in Herbs to, Ro Herbs to Provence, which is um, savory thyme, basil, and there's another one in there. And, and you can just tweak, to, tweak whatever herbs groups you wanna to put together and, and have fun making, making your own herb blends. So this is a, an easy one to grow. And uh, I discovered that if you don't, if you let it go to seed and you don't collect all those seeds, that you will have um, anise for a couple of years, just happily growing all on its own. Grows rapidly from seed. Yes, it does. Um, leaves can be cut when the plants are large enough. Um, you want to gather the seeds about a month after the flowers bloom, so you want to let those seeds get ripe. Again, as those seeds fall onto the ground, you'll have more anise growing, which is which is okay. Um, God, it has a wonderful, I mean, it's, to me, this is the, a kind of a Christmas herb, and you put this in your Christmas cookies, and it has just a wonderful flavor to it. And that's predominantly what it's used for is in confections, such as cakes and cookies. So this is a one you use for your baking. Menardia. This is, um, they've got trial gardens of Menardia down in Fort Collins, part of UW, um, CSU's plant, um, perennial plant beds. Um, is there a good source or do you have a template for herb container labels? Herb container labels, no. Um, mailing label stuck on. Not always really good about that. I know what I know what the herbs smell like, and so I know what's in there. My husband doesn't, <laughs> so, so he likes it when I label them. But whatever, whatever works. Um, Minardia is an easy one to grow. I've grown it in shade. I've grown it in moist soil. I've grown it in dry soil. <clears throat> it's it's a very tough one. Comes back easy, easy to grow. Um, very aromatic herb. So it's it's so if we go back and look at it, it's 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 whirled. So it, it's a little like a pinwheel up there. And so the leaves have got a great texture to them. The flowers are stunning. Tracks a lot of long-tongued bees. So like your bumblebees, honeybees aren't don't know what to do with Menardia because they can't get down in there. Their tongues aren't long enough. Um, hummingbirds love this one. They can, in the right area, they can be vigorous to the point of invasion. <laughs> so, um, but again, keep in mind that these guys really aren't drought tolerant and they do like to have a little bit more water. So 
You can use the leaves and the flowers. The flowers are actually very tasty. A lot of the stuff just goes into my soups or my salads, my summer salads. Baked goods, jellies, uh, one of the the uh, master, one of the 4-H kids um, harvested the flowers and made a syrup out of them for a 4-H project. I thought that was very cool. The um, Menardia or the bergamot, this is not the same bergamot that's used to flavor Earl Grayer tea. That's the flavoring in Earl Grayer tea is, is actually a citrus. So this is, this is a different essential oil. It's often used perfumes and cosmetics. So this is um, um, kind of a different use for this. Basil, I love growing basil. Oh my gosh, there's so many different varieties of basil. And if you, if you grow basil, try growing Thai basil. If you've never grown Thai basil before, it is such a treat. It's got a little bit of a licorice flavor to it, but it pairs really, really well with with fruits, especially a summer fruit salad. Um, Thai basil and watermelon is, is just an amazing combination. And dried, it's easy to dry, it's easy to blend in with other herbs. So it, it's kind of like your base note for making blends. And again, there's just um, dozens, maybe a hundred, 100 plus different basils to try to grow. They come large, they come small, they come compact enough that you can put them in containers. They come in colors, <laughs> different flavors. And, and so that's why, that's why um, this is kind of fun bedtime reading, seriously. Be, you, you're allowed now to be a geeky horticulture master gardener and read cattle, seed catalogs at night. Um, yeah, yeah, it's, this is also, um, Thai basil is a predominant herb in most of your Asian dishes. Yeah, and bee balm comes in different colors. It comes in a lot of different colors, a very pretty plant. But like I said, um, they've got trail gardens of basil, of, uh, of Minardia down at Colorado State University in Fort Collins. And th those plants are huge. They're, they're, some of them are three feet tall. <laughs> and they, it's like every color of the rainbow is there. So it's a lot of choices with your Menardia. Um, okay, back to basil. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, cultivars are af often named after the type of aroma they, they emit. So there's a lemon basil. There's, so I'm gonna cheat here. See if I can find some basils. Um, yeah, there's one called emerald wine basil, purple delight basil, purple ruffles, genovese. I think the genovese line of basil is the one that's got the most intense flavor. And that's from a culinary standpoint, that's one I really like to go to and throw in my soups. There's um, African blue basil. That's pretty mild flavored, maybe even a little hint of cinnamon to it. Ooh, lemon basil, lime basil, Persian, cardinal, anise basil. I mean, it's, it's just all over the chart, the flavors that you can pick up with basils. And again, they come, some of them are compact. I've grown some that have only gotten like six inches tall. They were that compact. And then there's some that I like to grow the real tall ones. <laughs> I don't know why I like to grow the real tall ones, but uh, just some of them have got some very intense flavors to them. A lot of choices. But you're not going to find them in the stores. You're, you're not going to go to the big box store, the hardware store, the grocery store, and expect to find a choice of basils. They're just going to send you, a, you know, you're going to have like two or three choices at the most. Okay, back to chat. Growing basil in the pot, in the house. Um, yeah, they're, they're pretty unhappy house plants. They get real leggy, they lose their flavor, they're prone to all sorts of funky diseases, um, fungal, bacteria problems, uh, insects, all of a sudden you got insects you didn't know you had. And, and so they, you can do it, but just understand that 
you know, as, as a master gardener now, you really have to stay on top of, of how you're growing it and the environment that it's growing in. So you really have to babysit this. It wants, it's gonna want really intense light. So the sunniest window you've got or under grow lights, and it's it's still gonna be even, even give you trouble then. Um, from Steve, I had a lot of trouble with the hybrid Genovese and powdery mildew inside. Um, <laughs> so it can, it can be a little challenging. Um, let's see, I had basil in a arrow garden, did really well operating the arrow garden, gets old enough and replacement lights are expensive. It's just, I'm just gonna just tell you, it's a, it's a miserable house plant, stay on top of it. Um, so basil is kind of an exception to the rule. It does like a little bit more of an acidic soil. So maybe some peat moss in the soil to help that out. Again, you just really don't want to, fer just don't fertilize. Just back alley soil is what I want, what these herbs do best in. And then pinch off the flower buds as soon as they start to emerge. And that's going to keep you busy because well, once they want to start to flower, they are off to the races. And that's where you just really have to stay on top of them, prune them, pinch them, harvest. You're gonna have more basil and you know what to do with. I make pesto with it. And I use the pesto in the winter in my soups and stews. So I probably have a lifetime of, of frozen pesto cubes in my freezer. And again, you can see, I mean, the list of different types of basils to grow are just, is just huge. You know, the African blue, lemon, cinnamon, Blue spice, blue spice is a good one to grow. Thai, Siam Queen, licorice, chocolate. Yeah, what flavor do you want? It's basil has it. Bay laurel. God, that's that, again, that's one of my favorite. Um, yeah, one of my favorites. Opal. Yep, opal is fun to grow. Um, you can grow bay laurel as a house plant, and. I'm gonna see if it's in the Richter catalog, but it's it's easy to grow. The the leaves itself, um, there's more it, when the leaves are fresh, the flavor isn't really there. So you you want to dry those leaves, and and that's where the flavor starts to develop. And I know I just been telling you, you know, you've got to you know pick it fresh. No, you know, stay off the fertilizer because that's where you want to concentrate the oils. But there are some herbs that the flavor is comes out and really sparkles when it's dried. You can use it fresh, but but you're going to have better, more intense flavor when it's when it's dried. And and at the same time, some other herbs um, lose their flavor when it's dried. Cilantro. I love cilantro, but it doesn't taste like anything once it's dried. And there's going to be a whole bunch. There's going to be some of you out there that go, God, I hate. I hate cilantro. Ooh, it tastes like soap. That's that's genetic. That's that's kind of beyond your control. That's you're not going to be able to um, ever get over that one. So bay laurel in the Richter's catalog. Um, you can buy it as plants. So they'll send you a little little tiny plant, little tiny bay laurel plant, and you know, your master gardener, you get to grow it up to be a big plant that you can harvest the leaves off of. And so it says here, like wine, thyme, and leeks, bay leaf is a foundational flavor in French cuisine. Meat, fish, and poultry dishes almost always have a touch. Frost sensitive small tree, best grown in tubs that afford easy movement indoors during winter. Bay seeds will not germinate if they dry out in storage. So it does flower and it does produce a seed. Um, so you can try that too, if you so inclined. But uh, zone, zone eight is as far north as it wants to go. So it's a house plant. It actually is a happy house plant. So there's, that's good news. Um, highly resistant to pest and disease. That's even better news. Um, dried leaves can be brewed into a herbal tea. Essential oil is obtained from the leaves, is used in making food flavoring, and essential oil from the fruit is used in soap making. So it's it's a multitasker. So that's always that's always a good thing, right? Multitasking 
herbs and fruit and vegetables. Yeah, yeah. Um, from Deborah, uh, love cilantro, use it on everything, eggs, salads, chili, sun cream, salutes. Yep, yep, I love, I love cilantro. Okay, Borge. The, the flowers are, are truly the color of the sky. It is just the most amazing blue. So if you've, if you've never grown um, borge before, it's, it's actually easy. I'm gonna say it's easy to grow, and then I'm gonna tell you that I have a hard time trying to grow it. But it likes, it likes that alkaline soil. So it likes a soil that's, a, that's like seven and a half to eight and a half. And I've got some friends out west of Cheyenne. It's just incredibly difficult soil. But they drop a borage seed, and next thing you know, they've, they've got a forest of borage growing, and they don't water it, they don't do anything. And it just it's just so easy for them to grow. And it tastes like cucumbers. So the flower is edible, and you can actually make a syrup out of the flowers. The leaves are edible. It's it's something you got to kind of get past the little fuzzy, but they're they're very tasty. And again, they do they do taste like like cucumbers, so it's wonderful. Um, for Valerie, mine takes over. It's almost evasive. I love it. Oh, the pollinators love it. Yes, the pollinators absolutely love this. And bees, I've had hummingbirds on mine. It really blue flower hanging hanging like that. But I've had bees on it, or hummingbirds on it, which really surprised me. Um, plant grows about two feet tall, my experience here. Easy to grow. The little seeds look like little hand grenades. And so, um, so they're really easy to, and they're big. They're big seeds, and they look like little hand, hand grenades. <clears throat> so easy to work with. Um, easy to work with with kids. Um, pick the blossoms after they open, use the leaves fresh any time. Usually don't use them dried. Uh, same thing with the flowers, you usually don't use them dried. You just throw them into your, into your salad. Um, we've added them into cream cheese and some picks up a little bit of flavor off of that. Um, and again, yeah, bees, bees love it. Um, throw it in your iced tea, throw it in your water, give us some flavor. So calendula, pot marigold. I just, I love the colors on this. This just is so bright and cheerful in the garden. It's, it's just absolutely wonderful. And it kind of comes in a few different colors of yellows and oranges. Easy to grow, not, doesn't really have any trouble with pests or disease. Light shade, full sun, it's not picky, doesn't complain. <laughs> Um, cut it back when the weather, um, if you can get it to overwinter, usually not. If you take it in as a kind of an unhappy house plant, you can cut it back and get it to um, get going again. Likes well-drained soil. I've, I've never noticed if it keeps bad bugs away or not. I, I've never paid enough attention to it to be able to tell you. But you want to harvest um, the foliage is edible, the flowers are edible. You wanna cut it young, so don't let it come August, don't go, oh yeah, I think I'll put some calendula in my cellar. You wanna you want to stay on top of it again, like most herbs, and, and, and trim it and use it often. But again, both the flowers and the foliage are edible. So I add some, some pretty, pretty color to your, your salads. And caraway, caraway is one, um, Another fun one to grow, did get away from me once in the garden and had it popping up all over the place. So it's a biannual. And that means that you're gonna plant the seed and it's, it e it's easy to grow from seed. You're gonna get this, what we call a basil rosette. And so it's just gonna be this basil mass of, of flowers and kind of a rosette pattern the first year. So it's just foliage the first year. And then the second year, it, it all of a sudden, it shoots up this huge stalk and then flowers. And so it's really beautiful when it flowers and it does attract a lot of the little seraphid flies. Those are good guys. You want them in your garden because those guys go after aphids. So it does attract the good guys, good, 
good native bees and native insects. You can cut the flowers and use the flowers in your salads, soups, summer soups. The seeds are usually what you're going for with caraway, and that is um, a flavoring that's typically used with baking. You can throw it in, of course, in your soups and stews and whatever, whatever else you kind of like caraway in. Um, you do oils of caraway seed if you're into doing that. Uh, do you have a master gardener, a couple master gardeners that distill oils from plants, from everything from geraniums to lavender to mint, and then have essential oils? So you can do that. Again, if the seeds get away from you, you will have caraway for a couple of years. That's that's okay. And then of course we already had a little discussion about cilantro and. If you let cilantro go to seed, then you harvest those seeds and the seeds are coriander. And you can grind up coriander and use it as a pepper substitute. So that's kind of, that's kind of a cool thing with this one. So this again, this is a multitasker. And the most intense flavor for cilantro is when it's a young, small plant in your garden. And I've grown this guy in full sun, part shade. I've grown it in the shade. So it's very flexible where it wants to grow. Not fussy soil. So, you know, it's just, just plain old plain, unamended soil is what it wants. And it, again, you either you like cilantro or you don't. And I've, it's kind of like beets. People either like beets or they hate them, one, one way or the other. <clears throat> but again, the seeds are, are, are little round things. You can, again, you can grind them up. Um, you can mix them with pepper, make kind of your own pepper blend, but, but they are a good substitute for pepper. Hops. So these pictures are all from, from my hops. Um, it's the monster that lives underground. I, I just <laughs> really wish I had never planted hops. And it's been there for about 20 years and I have, I've tried everything. Roundup, sheep, goats, and this is, this is one where if you're going to grow hops, be really, really careful where you plant it and I have a lot of friends who are growing hops in tubs so that it doesn't get away from them. But once it gets away, I, I've had this come up 10 feet away from the, the main plant. And it is the monster underground. So just, just take that as a word of caution. If you want to grow hops, you can, yeah, I want to do beer and I, I want these hops cones so I can make my own beer or, and hops is, is a, there's more use to hops than just beer. And it it's actually prevents gram-negative bacteria from growing. And so it's been used as a natural preservative for probably a couple hundred years. And the Germans used it originally and patented it for adding, for just, for just exactly that as a natural preservative. But you can use it as a dye um, you can use it more as flavorings. You can make a tea out of it. So we've got a couple um, hops like Virginia creeper. You can get rid of Virginia creeper. <laughs> you can you can at least kill that kill Virginia creeper back. But hops, the root structure underground, is is the big brother to bindweed, and I, I kid you not, it is just very, very difficult to get rid of. So be very careful. There, there's like six or eight different varieties of hops to grow. There's, if you wanna see hop, how hops are being grown, there's a couple, there's three places to go look. Um, at Scott's Bluff, at the Panhandle Research Center, they've got a real nice hops yard. And I think Gary, Gary Stone's in charge of it and he's got, six different varieties growing. Colorado State University at their, their North Research area, north of Fort Collins, they've got hops, a big hops yard down there. And then there's another hops research area in Grand Junction. Um, Dr. Curtis Swift had started that. 
And so there's a couple of places where if you really want to see how hops are doing, and I think, I think we're growing hops either up in Powell or Sheridan to see how they're doing, how they do up in the northern climate. But again, that's that's a permanent research. They'll they'll never get rid of that, just never. And if again, I, you you probably have gotten the message by now that it 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 can be hard to contain, hard to control. Grow it in a tub, a plastic tub. Grow it in something where it can't break out. You grow it on top of the ground. It, you're gonna have to water it and care for it. But it, it's it, it'll it'll take over and you'll never get that back. Okay, off my soapbox. <laughs> if you want hops cutting, let me know and I'll give you some of mine. Okay, lavender. Lavender, I, I have been trying to grow lavender for quite a while. I have grown the um, Augustifolias, which do best here. I've got a new variety in the ground called Phenomenal. It's a, it's a new cultivar that's supposed to be good to zone four. The zone fives really, zone five, the USDA zone five really ends on the north side of Fort Collins. And we're really Cheyenne, Laramie County. This whole area is really a zone four. And you know, when you get up into Wheatlands, they drop back down into a zone five. Torrington is zone five. They can grow a lot more stuff up there than we can. But the lavender again wants um, does not want to be overwatered. This is how you'll kill it if you overwater it. Best grown in rocky, dry, sunny place. Doesn't like good soil, doesn't want to be fertilized. It does need to be pruned and shaped for longevity. So anytime you see the lavender fields and you see that they're they're in this neat little right roundish mound, that's how they keep them living for a long time. When you when you just let them grow scraggly, they're really short-lived, maybe seven or eight years, but if you keep them pruned. That's a 20 year plant, 20 year old plant. So they do take some work. There's the reward for them is, is wonderful. The fragrance on them is amazing. You can cook with them, you can bake with them. A, a little lavender goes a long way. It's too much lavender and whatever you're baking or cooking with, it can become soapy flavored. It's not good eats. So a little goes a long ways. And I, I've seen lavender growing here in Cheyenne in, in some really interesting places. And the owners didn't know that they had lavender. <laughs> and so, um, but don't, don't get too fussy with their care. You know, the la benign neglect goes a long ways for lavender. So, so chat. In the chat from Karen, how do you prune it into a ball cut back severely? Just get out um, your favorite pruners and they just grab a hold of it. So like down in this, down in my picture here, um, this is a real young lavender plant. This is one I just planted. And you're just gonna grab a hold of the upper foliage, the flowers, just grab a hold of it and then just get in there and cut and then just, just shape it into a round, sphere, ball, whatever. Scissors, pruners, whatever is comfortable in your hand. Yep. So there, there's a bunch of varieties now that, that other people are growing and seem to be having some pretty good luck with besides the Heidecott and Munstead. And so again, um, I'm not trying to push Richter's, but by golly, They've got a really good list of, of lavender in here. And again, you can, I do encourage you to mail order it as a plant and, and not as the seed, um, unless you're Barb Gorges <laughs> and, and you grow it from seed and it's, it works out well for you. Um, I, yeah, no. Um, but the Richter's catalog will give you all sorts of information. Seed Savers Exchange will too. Um, there's other places online to order it. There's a huge lavender association down in Colorado. 
and they sell a lot of lavender. So in the Grand Junction area is probably the pretty pretty close to um, a Mediterranean type climate as you're going to get in this area. So uh, a lot of places to get it. Don't have to go through a catalog. There's a lavender festival down in um, is it Paonia, Colorado, which is just kind of a stone throw away from Grand Junction. A lot of fun to go through. A lot of fun. Uh, if you do go to the Lavender Festival, um, do make sure you get to tour their the lavender gardens and lavender fields because you will learn a lot. Everybody has their own way of watering it, their own way of pruning it, and so it's it's um, it, it's <laughs> there's no wrong or right way, I guess, but you can overwater it and it'll kill it. So from Karen, if you cut all of these herbs before they flower, how do they attract pollinators? I've been letting my herbs bloom just to attract the bees. Yeah, go ahead. It, you know, if you're doing it for the bees to attract pollinators, by all means, um, just let them just let them grow and harvest what you can. Just understand the flavor isn't going to be quite as intense. And after a while, I get tired of pruning my basil, and I just let it. I just it's like whatever. And I just let it go. And then from Shirley, uh, there's a propagator here in Sheridan that lives in Story. She is selling Jan's lavender. Jan is her neighbor. It is overwintered. I bought it a couple times, and we'll see how this how it does. Yeah. So there was a, a lavender farm. There's a couple lavender farms here in, in Laramie County. There was a lavender farm up in uh, Wheatland, up in Platt County. And so they do pop up around the state from time to time. Okay, mint. This is another one you've got to stay on top of. But again, mint likes cool, shady, part shade, does not want full sun. And so that's, that's why that lady and your neighbor in Rock Springs, I think it was, didn't do well with hers. Um, but they really, they, they don't want full sun. Let's see if I can find that again in the chat. Um, let's see. Yeah, um, from Rock Springs. Yeah, my neighbor tried to plant mint on a slope in her backyard, didn't do well. It was a southwest facing and the heat in Rock Springs was just brutal. Yeah, bad location. Yeah, hands down, yes. And this is where, you know, I taught the site analysis class, and this is where it goes back to, to knowing your microclimates and, and knowing how the sun moves through your property and knowing where the hot, dry, cool, moist places are at. And so I've got my mint growing on the north side of my, my little cabin here. And, you know, I keep it fairly moist. And I've I planted this, this was a new plant this year, and I had to cut it back about six times. It just, it was happy, it took off. Kind of a gravelly soil with a little bit of, of topsoil amended in there, no fertilizer. No, <laughs> I don't wanna encourage this. I don't wanna have another hops problem. So, but it does want it shady, and it does want it cool and moist. Hope that one, hope that helps on that with your neighbor. And again, um, peppermint, spearmint. So they're, they look a little different. They definitely taste different. Um, I kind of skipped the, the rich soil. I, it's a gravelly soil that I've amended a little bit, but um, definitely moist, cool, moist soil. And um, Frequent cuttings, you gotta, you gotta stay on top of this guy. You can do, uh, you can just um, do essential oils with it. And again, I got a master gardener here that's doing that. Leaves are used in teas, flavorings, chewing gum, confection, soaps, liqueur. So it has, it's a, it's a good multitasker. And then you can let it bloom and it will attract bees. The bees, my, my honeybees just love it. I think that's great. So a lot of different mints, and again, if you go through the, any of the catalogs, the, the list of mints is as long as your arm. And the one that I kind of always get a chuckle about is, you know, mojita, and the cock, especially the cocktail, and 
there is a mojita mint and it's it's true mint and it's native to cuba so you're not going to get it to grow here and so if you get a mojita cocktail they're not using the right mint just saying um oregano oh love oregano now way you tell real oregano from some of the pretenders the fake ones and there are some pretenders out there is when you take oregano you take that little leaf and you you want to put it in your in your mouth and kind of crush it between your lips and your teeth and oregano true oregano is going to make your tongue tingle and that's how you know that it's true oregano and i still got a question in the chat um, Sabine, uh, I have mojito mint growing. It overwinters under a pile of two by fours. That works. That works. <clears throat> okay, I like growing oregano. I've got quite a bit of it. Um, one time I had a plant that sort of tried to take over a high tunnel. Sprawling stems grow two feet tall. Uh, plants much coarser than sweet marigem. Smells more like thyme and small white flowers. So sometimes sweet marigem is sold as oregano and it's not. And again, the way you tell that this is true oregano is you chew on a leaf. And if it makes your tongue tingle, it's oregano. Um, grows well in poor soils, can be propagated by seed or division. Replant when plants become woody in three to four years. And, and they do really kind of become scraggly about four or five years into their life and they, they do need to be replanted. So don't do that. <laughs> Use fresh leaves um, and you can also dry the leaves. So the, it does retain quite a bit of its flavor dry. And of course you, you can't have pizza or Italian food without oregano. So this is always a great one to use. Um, you can also sprinkle it over lamb or steak rubbed with lemon juice to other Italian sauces. Love oregano. Easy to grow. Very easy to grow. So wild marigem. Again, this one is a lot of times sold. If you go to the big box stores, you'll see um, kind of a confusion of herbs. And wild marigem is has a pink or pinkish purple flower and it's it's a very aggressive grower i mean just very very fast sprawling will we'll try to take over and when you taste the leaves there's nothing there it's just kind of a culinary zero if you want to grow it for the bees by all means this is a great bee plant but from a culinary standpoint it just isn't there <clears throat> yeah the greek and oregano it, the flavor should be intense enough that it numbs or makes your tongue tingle. And the flower is white. So that's how you tell the difference. And rosemary. Um, I've had a few master gardeners and I've tried, also tried to get this to overwinter. Doesn't, doesn't do well, doesn't do well in the high tunnel. Um, I, it, it's kind of a miserable house plant. Likes a lot more water as a house plant, but it, it certainly will reward you beautifully when it does does grow and grow well. And I, I usually just treat it as a summer annual. And the fragrance you just you just brush the leaves and you can smell that warm aromatic coming off the leaves. And I've been in some sensory gardens out in California where they had oregano or had rosemary in the sensory garden. And when you brushed up against it, it just was very, very delightfully fragrant. It was wonderful. Um, likes well-drained, sunny locations, propagated from cuttings, grown from seed. Use a fresh leaf, use it dried. Um, dried and ground, they, it doesn't last real long. So you want to keep it as a whole leaf and then grind it when you need it so that you still have those, those flavors and those volatile oils are there. Um, it says, my oregano blooms pink and lavender. It's probably wild marigem. 
It's not, it's not, taste it, go taste the leaves. That'll, they'll tell you in a heartbeat whether you've got oregano or wild marijuana, but my bet is that that's wild marijuana. Um, yeah, um, mine is in the heated greenhouse bed. It's best plant, the oil is rich and sticky. Yeah, wonderful. <laughs> I, rosemary is one of those go-to herb blends. I like to use that, grind it all up just before I use it. Yeah, lovely. Um, all from leaves is used as a medicine. So you can find um, you can find a lot of this stuff in the health food stores, but just just be careful. Some of this um, some of it is is specific to certain things, and like oil of oregano, it's best used for like bacteria type infections. It doesn't do anything for viruses. So you just have to be really careful. You have to be really knowledgeable, almost an herbalist, if you want to get into the medicinal end of things. Sage. This is a, a sage that I've got growing in my, my little, I've got a small high tunnel, 20 by 14. It's kind of my, kind of dubs as an herbarium. And I had a little trouble with some flea beetles on it, but otherwise this is a pretty, bomb proof, easy to grow plant. Started from seed or cuttings, um, full sun. Uh, I've grown it in part shade. It does really well. And, and again, another about every three to four years, it gets really kind of woody and starts to lose its flavor. So I usually pull it out and start over again. Um, lemon balm. I, I've had good luck with lemon balm. I usually get it as a plant and grow it from a plant. Um, so it's, um, again, um, I love using it, but hard to find here as a seasoning. Yeah, I just grow your own. <laughs> You're a master gardener now. Grow your own. Grow your own. Um, oh, different sages. Gosh, and they come in different colors. Variegated leaves, bright green leaves, dull green leaves, and different levels of flavor. So that's, it's just a wonderful... Um, a wonderful plant to use the sages salvia officialis and another good bee plant so if you're, if you're growing stuff for bees salvia the sage salvia officialis another really good one makes a very nice mild flavored honey and i've got quite a bit of of salvias growing in my yard or my garden and again, they come all sorts of colors and shapes, flavors. Some of them do well here. Some of them are perennials. Some of them are annuals. So you just kind of have to hunt, hunt around, find the right one for you. French tarragon. Mm. Nice, spicy, licorice sort of flavor to it. And this is one that you can bake with as well as cook with. So that's another, another fun one. But there's also... This, this one can also be another one that's a little tricky if you buy it in a big box store because the people at the big box store, they don't care. So you always want to try to buy your tarragon and your rosemary and uh, your oregano from a, a reputable outlet. Same thing with your mints. You really should buy those from someone who knows, you know, who's very honest about what they're selling. Um, <clears throat> again, I've got a tarragon plant that's about 10 years old, maybe a little bit older. It's about two to three feet tall, sprawling all over the place, and that's okay. Um, but there is another one, there's another imposter on the market here with this, and it's the Russian tarragon. And the Russian tarragon will bloom and produce seed. And again, the Russian tarragon is, is kind of that imposter that you might see in the big box stores being sold as a French tarragon. Taste the leaves. That's that's where you're going to find out where the flavor is at, and you're going to find out is this a real thing or not. Because French tarragon is going to have that that licorice anise type flavor to it, where the Russian tarragon has no flavor. So, if you're using this for culinary purposes, you want the flavor. If you're attracting, if you're putting it into a, a bee garden. This is still going to be just, um, the Russian is still just going to be more of a short-lived perennial or an annual. 
but it will it flowers, so it'll bring in the bees, but no flavor, no culinary use to it. Thyme. This is just I love using it, and I think the flavor's got a great punch to it. It's hard to harvest. Those little tiny leaves, my gosh, little little tiny. I've stripped them off. I gave up and throw. I just throw a stem and everything in there, and I just pick the stems out after a while. A lot of different flavors, a lot of different uses. A culinary group, a ground cover group. Then there's the citrus group. So you've got a lot of choice with this and they're easy to grow. I've got some growing in full sh full shade, some in full sun. None of them are in great soil. They're all in kind of a gravelly, nondescript, under fertile soil. And they do well. They do very well in it. They do want more water. They they um they're all, all in drip irrigation and they're pretty happy with that drip irrigation. So kind of uh question here in chat yeah that's what Rachel Ray does cuts it all up and throw it yep just cut it all up in the little tiny bits the stems and everything just throw it in there don't worry about it yep okay so kind of a recap herbs are pretty easy to grow they're not fussy they they don't want don't spend time making special soil for them don't don't go crazy with the soil don't um, don't over mend the soil. No manures in the soil. Um, you don't you don't want that. You know, food safety comes first, and food safety starts in the garden. And so, no no manures. Uh, it just ramps up the salt, and that's never a good thing. So, no miracle grow. Just, just put them in the soil and make sure they get get water every other day. Just water them every other day. Drip irrigation is best. Um, full sun to part shade, harvest in the morning, and be creative in the kitchen with them. Make your own blends. Dry them, you know, either make your own dryer, <laughs> turn a car into a dryer, um, get, a, get a regular dryer. I used to use a Mr. Coffee dehydrator for years. That worked great. Um, so there's a lot of different ways that you can preserve these herbs. A lot of them you lose the flavor when you when you dry them. Some of them do better frozen. A lot of them do great as an infusion in vinegar, so you can make your own salad dressings. That's that's wonderful to make your own salad dressing and have that versatility. It's a lot less expensive, fraction of the calories. So there's a lot to be said about that one. And and again, if you're I'm going to stop sharing here just briefly. If you're not sure about your soil, and I, th I think we talked about it before, but if you're not really sure, you know, this the simple easy test is to just go grab a, a clear soda bottle, put so much, put, you know, about a third or well, fourth of it of, of your soil in there, shake it up really well, and this will tell you what your soil is. It's not going to tell you what's in your soil what the NPK is, but it's going to tell you what your soil structure is. And again, this is just a clear bottle, clear plastic bottle. I threw some soil in there. I added water. I shook it up really well. I let it, it's been sitting. It takes about 30 minutes. You know, this is my pathetic amount of organic material. The colored area is the clay. And then you have to look at it pretty close, but then there's a layer, a pretty good layer of silt. And then I've got sand, and then I've got some, some bigger sand pebbles down in there. And so, but this is just a, a fast way to cheat and find out exactly what you've got in your soil so that you, you have an idea what you're working with. And then, of course, if you really want to know what your NPK, your pH, and your EC are, um, Colorado State University Soils Lab, it's a great place to go. There's, um, you always want to keep to a, a regional soil lab, someone that's close to home. So don't send it back east, don't send it out to Missouri, keep it close to home. And 
so a couple questions in chat. Um, fresh rosemary and olive oil is amazing. Yeah, you can do a lot of herb infusions in olive oil and, and have some really nice flavors come out of that. Really easy to do. Um, yeah, that's nice. So what about growing garlic? Garlic's easy to grow. It, you, can, you can do it a couple of ways. And I'm gonna go back to my screen here. And, okay, cool. Um, so this is kind of the question time. Um, garlic is really easy to grow. You can either, typically, typically you plant garlic in late September, you cover it with a thick layer of mulch, like straw or grass clippings. You want to get that moisture in there so you've watered it well, you've mulched it in well. Um, if you might, might want to throw some chicken wire over there, over it to keep the wind from blowing the mulch away and weight that down. Um, or you can plant it in the real early spring. You can plant it like in April and you're going to harvest it later but you can still grow it. You know, if you, if you, if you miss September, there's, you still have time. You, you can still grow it early spring, harvest it later. And of course, you know, as it grows, it can, it puts out those, what's called scapes, and you can harvest those scapes and chop them up and throw them in your, in salads and soups. The, 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 green, the green part is, is just wonderful. It's very flavorful. So, yeah, easy to grow garlic. Um, from Karen, I grow a ton of garlic, rich soil water three times a week. Dig in late August, can replant September. Yeah, I don't. Um, again, you don't you don't need a lot of fertilizer in there. You just want to be real careful with that. Easy to grow. You want to dry it once you harvest it you do need to dry it you need to put it on like some sort of a drying rack so that that papery outer covering dries well and you don't have mold that's that's really the big trick is is drying it post harvest post harvest handling is really really critical and again that food safety aspect is is there and, and post harvest handling is be careful so there's a lot of herbs, a lot of different herbs. I've just really touched on the top, the, the top of it. Um, roses are considered an herb. You can grow roses, petals from roses are, um, almost all the varieties are edible. Um, you, can, you can dip them in like egg whites and roll them in sugar and make, make fun decorations for cakes out of them. Or you can throw them in your salad and eat them. Um, so question, um, if you have soft, yeah, garlic comes as both soft neck and hard neck garlic. And the hard neck garlic is gonna be the real, the real hot peppery. You know, if you like, if you like that punch of flavor, the hard neck is where you wanna go because that's where the flavor is at. Um, elephant garlic really isn't a true garlic. It's more of a kind of a funky onion. Um, chives, chives are really easy to grow. Those, you drop the seeds and you've got a garlic plant that, bunches up and you can you can dig that bunch up and divide them and replant them all over the place I've got I've got I've done that with most of my chives I've dug them up and replanted them all sorts of places the bees and the bumblebees love that blossom big big purple blossom on them and the bees just love that and then that blossom <laughs> you can harvest a few for yourself and chop it all up and throw it in a, in a salad and it's wonderful in a salad or you can mix it up into some cream cheese and make a make a tasty dip out of that so chives are, are another versatile multitasker in your garden they can be part of the the perennial landscape bed they can you can edible every part of them is edible so they're another one that's really kind of fun to have in there um what else any other questions, thoughts, comments? Again, the, um, oh, I'm gonna stop sharing here. I'm gonna drop my screen. Um, wild onions, yeah, onions, onions can become perennialized. If you don't harvest them, they'll, 
they'll become a, a perennial in your in your garden and that's okay because again the flowers attract the bees and so that's that's great um so my my herb i've got an herb book here that's culinary and i picked this up i was in a botanic garden back east a couple years ago and this is herbs for flavor health and natural beauty by jim rood and jenna carlin and it's a beautiful book and they each chapter deals with a different herb and so they got a whole chapter just on basil then one on chives cilantro dill lemon balm verbena oregano parsley rosemary sage tarragon thyme so every chapter is just on a specific herb but they um they look at it from both a culinary you know from from sweet all the way to savory and so this is a berry basil float i think that's you know that looks yummy i chris you grow a lot of strawberries <laughs> basil and, and strawberries who would have who would have guessed putting those together um, but there's some really good recipes in here and i've tried quite a few of them and uh, cilantro and vegetable spring rolls uh, fried green tomato and napoleon all sorts of stuff in here it's, it's a it's a great book and it just really focuses just on herbs from a culinary standpoint i've never seen um, a book as well put together and beautifully done beautiful pictures so that's pretty cool um that's pretty much what i've got for the herb class i hope i was able to cover what you guys were were looking for and if you have any questions by all means i've tried to answer them as they've been been popping up yeah thank you catherine um great presentation um the basil, I love fresh basil. So I've not tried it with strawberries, so I'll let you know because both of those things are in my garden. Yeah. Uh, but I've not combined them before. But basil yeah. with, oh, it's just ev in everything in the summer though. So okay. it will be in my strawberries next summer. There you go. Yeah, it's, it's like tarragon would pair well with strawberries too. And I've had tarragon and, um, Thai basil and all that stuff with with fruit with fresh fruit and it's it's delightful it's just delightful mm -hmm. so I think I think what happens is we get in this little box you know we see these little jars of herbs on the grocery store shelves and we think oh they're just for soups and stews and and we and we stop thinking outside the box with these guys but they're just so versatile so many uses for them and I I have a cupboard and a couple of drawers just dedicated to my herb collection and herbs for cooking and herbs for baking with. And so they're a lot of fun. A lot of fun. Uh, chat box here. Uh, <clears throat> Is there a resource to find out the correlation of ancient herb names and current ones? It sounds like some pretty esoterical research. Um, I know there's a there's a huge, you know, there's a lot of overlap with with some of those ancient herbs and modern herbs, and the names have pretty much stuck with them. But I don't know if there's a resource out there for that. Um, basil is easy to grow again. You just keep it on a drip system. It's pretty forgiving. Use, use the miracle grow on your petunias and your lawn. You didn't hear me say that right, Chris. <laughs> use miracle grow on your lawn. <laughs> uh. Yeah, I don't have any other suggestions for the historical resources 
Uh, I wonder about some, you know, yeah, herbal medicine text that Janet suggested in the text box, but I, yeah, I don't have anything to add there. Yep. So the, the hyssop officialis, um, in the Richter's catalog, it does go to zone three, which is always good news. A decorative plant with a refreshing aromatic scent, essential oil used in perfumes, slightly bitter leaves are finely chopped on game meats and in salad soups and stews helps digestion. Uh, showy blue flower spikes. Okay. Okay, the author of the herb book was um, Jim Rude, R-U-D-E, and Jenna Carlin. And I will put that in the chat. published by Hobble Creek Press out of Springville, Utah, and I found it at a botanic garden in Janesville, Wisconsin. So that was, that's an interesting travel. And um, it was um, published in 2017. Um, getting into herbalism the next year. So yeah, there's some really good online herbal classes for, for doing the becoming an herbalist. I've got several master gardeners down here in Laramie County that are herbalists and very fascinating area. I think, Chris, I don't know, I think Bobby Holder might be an herbalist. Um, have taken all those courses for that. <clears throat> Okay, Chris. All right. Anything well, else? very good. Uh, I think we're top. Oh, I'm sorry. So I kind of ended a little early, but that's okay. No, that's okay. Well, this was uh, this was part of your uh, vegetable gardening class originally, but I'm glad we had more time to go a little bit more in depth into both of those classes. So yeah. uh, this worked out well, and so yeah, thank you very much, Catherine. Oh, this has been wonderful. I really appreciate it. Um, so I hope um, hope you have a nice break for Christmas and the new year. Yep. Thank and, you. Uh, you yeah. Um, I'm looking forward to a a, a relaxing week or so, um, and then I'm looking at the schedule for the spring master gardener class as we were chatting earlier uh, this afternoon. So, um, and then we'll, we'll gear back up for 2021 and hope for a, uh, a little bit better of a 2021. <laughs> uh, so anyway, uh, thank you again, Catherine. Thanks for everyone for joining us. I'll put the recording up uh, for everyone tomorrow and uh, we'll see you after the new year. Thank you. All right, good night, everybody. Thanks.